الحمد لله وكفى الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى خصوصا على أفضلهم وخاتم النبيين محمد الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونزلنا عليك الكتابة بيانا لكل شيء وهدى ورحمة وبشرى للمسلمين صدق الله العظيم uh, Respected brother Zainul Abidin the Nazir of Masjid Al-Mu'minun here in Subang Jaya in Kuala Lumpur respected Imam brothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Our topic is on Islamic eschatology or ilmu akhiru zaman and the reality or the haqiqah of the world today Islamic eschatology and the reality of the world today what is that reality it's strategic political economic monetary social religious reality and what explanation does Islamic eschatology offer concerning that reality we never had this as a branch of knowledge in our civilization now it was never taught in our institutions of Islamic learning rather we had in hadith we had a book of hadith called Kitab al Fitan and in that you would study the hadith pertaining to Akhir al Zaman we could not have this branch of knowledge over the last 1000 years because you need to do more than simply narrate the ahadith you need to explain and you need to interpret and you need to take all the data in the ahadith and relate them to the Quran link them to the Quran and build an integrated and a harmonious body of knowledge on Akhir zaman and that could not be done until this age <laughs> so this is the first time that it is possible for us to develop the branch of knowledge known as Ilmu Akhir zaman as a branch of knowledge and not just as a repetition of a hadith and it is my good fortune that I was the student of a great teacher who gave to me the foundation and the methodology with which I am now able to do what I am doing may Allah have mercy on the soul of that great teacher Maulana Dr. Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah who visited Malaya before you became Malaysia <laughs> who visited Malaya as a Muballik and his teacher Maulana Muhammad Abdul Alim Siddiqui Rahimahullah also visited Malaya many times before of course you were born and in fact had a base in Singapore so I come from a from a generation of scholars 
who have had links with this part of the world and who now sleep in their grave and may Allah have mercy on their soul because of them it is possible for me to do what I'm now doing but I'm not doing this merely to entertain you so you can say Allah, what a nice lecture and go home and sleep <laughs> not at all for tomorrow I will also be in my grave and at that time I hope that you would raise your hands and make dua that Allah might have mercy on my soul and forgive me my sins I am doing what I am doing so that wherever these words reach you and now because of the internet uh, these words reach very far <laughs> we have two young men from Britain I won't mention their names who travel from Britain spend a lot of money to come here to be here tonight to attend this lecture and tomorrow night's lecture uh, and uh, there's another sister they all students of mine came from Britain and they're here tonight but I'm doing what I'm doing with the hope and with the prayer that you would assess what is being taught I have respect for my audiences respect for their intellect and I insist that whenever I offer an opinion they should never accept it unless and until they are convinced that it is correct I wish our politicians could speak like that <laughs> <laughs> when once you are convinced that it is correct it's no longer my knowledge it's yours and now you must join me and help me in reaching out this explanation to others tonight as we turn to Islamic eschatology and the reality of the world today there are some in other parts of the world who would say oh but we heard this before but remember this is Masjid al-Mu'minun and this is the first time I've come to this masjid and there would be many who are listening to me for the first time so do please be patient with me if you're listening on the internet <laughs> and so this lecture is delivered primarily for those who are present here tonight but it is also delivered for those who have been listening to me and reading my books and who have been acquiring some knowledge of the subject so that you may now go out and teach others and so that the word may go out to others but I'm delivering this lecture for a third reason and that is that we now live in an age of secularism uh, that was the topic of my lecture on Saturday night Islam, secularism and crime it's a secular world a world which says that religion and politics must be kept separate from each other which is why shaitan has taken over politics when you keep religion and politics separate from each other guess who takes over politics when you keep religion and the economy separate from each other guess who takes over the economy <laughs> this is the age of secularism and while there are those who are hostile to us in many parts of the world who are waging war on Islam who have no respect for us who will lose no opportunity to degrade us and make us look bad there are others many others in the world who are secular secular in thought secular in scholarship and who are now interested 
in Islam. Who want to know what does Islam have to say about the reality of the world today. For example, the State University of Moscow in Russia, which has recently made contact with me. And I hope, inshallah, to visit them shortly. These are people who are interested, although secular. And they are not hostile to us. And so I am giving you this lecture so that wherever you are, you can reach out to them in the universities. The bastions of secularism. Reach out to them and share with them what does the Quran have to say? What does Nabi Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam have to say about the reality of the world today? This is Akhirul Zaman from our perspective, the last age. And Akhirul Zaman is not the end of the world. Let them know that. Akhirul Zaman is first of all the end of history. History culminates with the final and conclusive triumph of truth over all rivals. Washington could do what they want, they can't prevent it. The truth must triumph. And that triumph of truth over all rivals, of justice over monstrous lies and oppression, that triumph will come, Islam says, when the son of Mary, Nabi Isa alayhi salam, returns. <coughs> that is the end of history. After that, no one knows how long, don't ask me, I don't know, will come the end of the world. <laughs> And when the end of the world comes, then the mountains would be like pieces of cotton wool, Cameron Highland, like cotton wool. <laughs> and uh, on that day, the earth is going to speak. And all the secrets will be revealed. And on that day, this material reality will be transformed into something new, something different. A new world will come and we will emerge in a new form. Innakum lafi khalkin jadid, says Allah. That is the end of the world. Qiyamah. And then the resurrection. And then judgment. But this is not taught in universities now anymore. I don't know why not taught in universities anymore. Hmm. But we are concerned with the end of history. And we say from our perspective, our eschatology, that history is going to end <coughs> with the whole world coming under the rule of one rule. How did we know that? Where did we get that knowledge? That all of mankind have to be brought together as one society, one world. That's what Islam says, not the Washington Post, Islam. And all of mankind will come under the rule of one rule. One people will rule the world at the end of history. And that one people will rule the world so that one man will emerge. And Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam described him to us. And you know it. 1400 years ago, but we're too busy eating roti chanai. <laughs> <laughs> he, he described to us that man who at the end of history will rule the world, or rather, would attempt to rule the world. He said he would be a Jew. Does that make him an anti-Semitic? Eh? Is this anti-Semitism? No, Nabi Muhammad spoke. 
He said he would be a Jew. He would be a young man. He would be powerfully built. And he would have curls. And I always thought it meant curly hair. Until an Egyptian came to me and said, no, no shake. It is the curls that the Orthodox Jews have on the side of the head. That is what the Prophet is talking about. Hmm? So it's good to listen to your students sometimes. You learn from them. So he would be a young man. He'd be powerfully built. He'd have curls, the Orthodox Jews curls. And he would, he would declare from Jerusalem, I am the Messiah. So wherever you are in the world, listen, you got to explain to them the subject of the Messiah. You got to explain to them, and my lectures will help you, that there is the true Messiah. And he came as the son of a virgin mother, and uh, he declared that he was the Messiah, but they said no. You're not the Messiah. When I billah min hadha, you're a bastard. You cannot be the Messiah. Why? Because your mother was not married. What they did not know, and you and I know, is that Allah caused the virgin to give birth to a baby boy. Allah can do lots of things, you know. He can even cause gold dinar and silver dirham to be used as money tomorrow yeah I'm not speaking too loud as yet because that's sunnah money and that's halal money and so they said no you cannot be the messiah and then they said he must die for this declaration of his and they forced the hand of the Roman government and so on. And when they saw him die on the cross, before their very eyes, said, no, you can't be the Messiah because the Messiah has to rule the world. And you're dead. <laughs> you can't be the Messiah. We have to explain to the world what Allah says in the Quran. Number one, no, they did not crucify him. Number two, no, they did not kill him. Number three, Allah made it appear like that. Number four, Allah took his soul and made it appear that he died, that he was killed. He took his soul. And number five, that Allah raised him. These are the five things. Uh, there's a book of mine at the back which most of you should have read by now because it's available both in English and Bahasa Jerusalem in the Quran it is my bestseller and in that book there's a chapter on this subject hmm? so he did not die but Allah says every soul must taste death so he has to come back one day he's coming back but Nabi Muhammad والسلام, explained that before he comes back they are waiting for the Messiah because they rejected him. We are waiting for the Messiah to come back. The Christians are waiting for the son of Mary to come back. They don't call him Messiah anymore. They, he's God. <laughs> But the Jews say he was not the Messiah. And the Jews say since Allah made a promise to send the Messiah, that promise must be kept. So they're waiting for the Messiah to come. And Islamic eschatology, more than any other eschatology in the world, explains that Allah is going to send a false Messiah. And that false messiah is going to make all efforts to impersonate the true messiah and to eventually rule the world from Jerusalem ruling over all of mankind that unfortunately also includes Russia. So 
So you understand where we're heading now? Hmm? <coughs> that also includes Russia, if you have to rule the whole world. And that also includes China. Huh? Not bad news for them. And when he rules the world from Jerusalem, I don't think there'll be many people still alive by that time. In order to get there, he would have caused the destruction of 90% of mankind to reach there. Hmm? But he has a PhD in deception. And he's known as Dajjal, the false messiah. Islamic eschatology tells us a lot, a lot about Dajjal. But most of it could not be understood could not be interpreted until events had unfolded in the world. And it is because those events have now unfolding, unfolded and are still unfolding that the scholar who devotes attention to the subject, you have to study politics, you have to study economics, you got to master monetary economics. You got to study banking if you want to penetrate this subject, young man. <coughs> you got to study history and the philosophy of history. You got to study comparative religion. The, the Torah must be studied. The Quran must be studied. <coughs> And you have to have the proper methodology to study. And then you'll be able to see the dots being put together, bringing the dots together to understand. I began Jerusalem in the Quran with these questions. Is it by accident that 2,000 years after Allah expelled the Jews from the Holy Land. The Holy Land is not Makkah and Medina. <laughs> the Holy Land is where the state of Israel is now squatting. That's the Holy Land, Palestine. Is it by accident that 2,000 years after Allah expelled the Jews from the Holy Land, put a ban on them that they could never return? until Gog and Magog are released and they spread out in all directions that today after 2,000 years the Jews are back in the Holy Land and they have reclaimed it as their own is this by accident if this is not by accident then tell me what it is that explains it we have our explanation. What is yours? Our explanation is that Dajjal is on his way to eventually arriving at the culmination of his mission of ruling the world from Jerusalem. 2,000 years after Allah destroyed the holy state of Israel, he sent a Babylonian army to destroy it. And then he sent the Roman army to destroy it. And if you read Surah Al-Isra, at the beginning of Surah Al-Isra, there are important lessons in political history. Political history at the beginning of Surah Al-Isra. Hmm? 2,000 years after the holy state of Israel was destroyed, a state of Israel now exists. Is it by act? Accident, or is there an explanation from it for it? Shall we drive to Putrajaya and ask for an, ax, an explanation? Shall we ask the New York Times for the explanation? Or what about CNN? Tell me what is your explanation? Ask the universities, they are the bastions of knowledge. What is your explanation or is it just by accident 
Israel was born just yesterday, 1948. And in this brief span of time, Israel now controls what you call the parliament, they call it the congress, of the ruling state in the world, the United States of America. Every American politician knows that. The Zionists control Congress. You can't succeed as a politician in the United States if you criticize Israel, you're finished. Israel today is a superpower. Israel possesses nuclear weapons, thermonuclear weapons. Israel can destroy Europe. And Israel is now poised to replace the United States of America as the next ruling state in the world. Is this happening by accident? I want you to go and ask them this question. Don't just sit down and listen to my lectures and say, Masha Allah, and then go home and sleep. <laughs> go out there and ask them these questions. Is this happening by accident? And tell them, if all of this can be by accident, well then, a cow can also jump over the moon. Is that scholarship? <laughs> this is our answer. Eschatology. We say that all of this is taking place because Dajjal, Al-Masih dajjal is on his way to culminate his mission of ruling the world from Jerusalem. Is it so difficult that you cannot come to Islam to study what Islam has to offer? The best da'wah in the world today is eschatology. If you are people involved in tabligh, I hope tabligh jamaat is listening to me. Sometimes they don't hear me. If you are involved in tabligh, if you are involved in da'wah, this is da'wah. This is the best, the best da'wah you can give today to invite mankind to Islam by offering to them the explanation that Islam has for the reality of the world today, which we will explain to you shortly. No, these things are not happening by accident. It is not by accident that dinar and dirham are no longer used as money. And now you minting them? Huh? And you're giving long lectures about dinar and dirham? Yeah? And you want all of mankind to return to dinar and dirham and you cannot answer even a simple question? What's wrong with you? That's all we are asking for. Just answer this question if you are Murabitun. Just answer this question if you are Hizbut Tahrir. Come on, why can't you answer the question? Is it by accident that dinar and dirham, gold and silver, are no longer being used as money anywhere in the world? Is it by accident that the International Monetary Fund prohibits the use of gold as money? Is this by accident? Will Murabi too never wake up? Will Hizbut Tahrir never wake up? Will Tabligh Jamaat never wake up? When will they wake up? I am tired. Because they wouldn't listen to me. And they say I'm misguided. And they're going on their own way. But they would not answer the question. They will not answer the question. Because they do not want to step into Islamic eschatology. The Salafi are no different. The Salafi are no different. I've been knocking and knocking and knocking at their door politely for a long time. And they will not listen to me. I believe perhaps one of the reasons why they will not enter into Islamic eschatology because 
they do not have the methodology and they do not have the capacity to be able to deal with this subject. Come on, prove me wrong. That's my challenge to them. Come on and prove me wrong. I will be happy. I will be delighted if you can prove me wrong. I say you are not doing it because you lack the methodology and you lack the capacity to be able to deal with this subject. That's why you're not doing it. And so tonight, for Masjid al-Mu'minun, I'm challenging you. Come on and prove me wrong. The strategic reality of the world today is that not just we are moving in the direction of one world, all of mankind coming together as one global society. But that there is a fly in the ointment. That there are those who refuse to bend their knees and bow. Russia under Vladimir Putin is not the same Russia under Stalin. The USSR or the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic and today's Russia are two different things. Russia used to be an atheist state. But while we were busy eating roti chanai and drinking tea tarik, something happened in Russia. Russia is being transformed before our very eyes and Russia is returning to Christianity. That is part of the strategic reality of the world today. And there is not one Christianity, there are two. There is the original Christianity which left the city of Rome when Constantine became Christian because Rome was too pagan and he established the city of Constantinople and no less a person than Nabi Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam used the name Constantinople so you can tell Mustafa Kamal get lost Mustafa Kamal, get lost. You cannot prevent any Muslim from using the name of the city that Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam used. So Mustafa Kamal, get lost. I know they're going to be annoyed with me in Turkey. But let's hope at the end of the day we'll be friends once more. When they realize you must show respect for Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam if you are Muslims. Hmm? So when Christianity went to Constantinople, that was the original Christianity. That was Eastern, Orthodox, Byzantium. And we know about it in the Quran. There is a whole surah of the Quran named after them. It's called Surah to Rome. Surah to Rum is Byzantium. It is Eastern Orthodox Christianity. And Allah speaks favorably about Rum in the Quran. At the beginning of Surah to Rum. And Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam prophesied whether Saudi Arabia approves or disapproves whether Qatar likes it or does not like it, whether those who are waging a Yankee Jihad in Syria and a Yankee Jihad in Libya and a Yankee Jihad in Algeria, whether they like it or they don't. Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam prophesied that we Muslims will make it an alliance with Rome. That's his words. And Russia today is Rome. It was Soviet Union yesterday, but it's Russia today. The strategic reality of the world today is this transformation taking place in Russia, which is linked to Akhirul Zaman. Who in the world of Islam today has an alliance with Russia? 
Any Sunni? Any Sunni country? Only one Shia country? <laughs> Iran? <laughs> Iran is an ally. Iran is an ally of Russia. Hmm? And where are the Sunnis? <laughs> they are polishing the shoes of Washington <laughs> or London <laughs> or the IMF. Where are the Sunnis? They are in the Zionist camp. Where are the Sunnis? When the Prophet said that we'll make an alliance with Rome. If you want to say to me Rome is Washington, Rome is a Zionist, I would suggest to you to make an appointment with a psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> and so, the strategic reality of the world today is that history is moving in a direction which confirms what Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam has said. I cannot possibly tonight take you all through the entire lecture but I'm giving you a taste of what you can do with the Quran and what you can do with the Hadith if you do your homework to take the universities and make them come to Islam to take the secular scholars and bring them to Islam at least they will show respect for Islam if they don't become Muslims. This strategic reality of the world today is that Russia will not bend her knees to the Zionists. But the Jal has to rule the world regardless of what he has to do. It doesn't matter to him. Even if he has to take mankind to a world war which will destroy most of mankind, it does not matter to him. And it does not matter to the Zionists. That is the strategic reality. Wake up. And that's where we're heading to. I know this is bad news. But we are heading inevitably to world war. And it's a world war which will make the first and second world war look like a fight over peanuts. Nabi Muhammad <coughs> told us about that war. What did he call it? Malhama. The Malhama. So I suggest it's time to go back home and do some homework. The Malhama would be so great a war said the Prophet that birds flying in the sky will fall long die. I understand this to imply that nothing will fly. And so there will be no more aerial warfare. Aeroplanes won't fly. Cruise missiles won't fly. And so warfare after the Malhama will either be on land or on sea. And this is why tomorrow night's lecture is crucially important. Constantinople. The conquest of Constantinople in Akhiru Zaman. That's tomorrow night's lecture. Because the Russian fleet in the winter has no exit through the snow. The only exit is through the Black Sea. And through the Black Sea, you have to pass through the Bosphorus to get into the Mediterranean Sea. And there's a city standing on the Bosphorus called Constantinople. And Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam said that a Muslim army will conquer Constantinople in Akhiru Zaman. What it implies is that Constantinople today is a NATO city controlled by NATO. And the Muslim army will get rid of NATO. And when NATO no longer controls Constantinople, the Russian fleet can now pass through into the Mediterranean. 
and that is the greatest danger of all to what remains of Israel. So there is a strategic dimension to the subject that only Islam, only Islam explains. China will be an ally of Russia because China also will not bend her knee. I'm not, I'm not talking about the Chinese in Singapore, no. <laughs> That's little Israel. I'm talking about China. China will not bend her knee. No. The Chinese are proud of their civilization. And they will not bend their knees to Israel. And if you look at the strategic map of the world, you see all the indicators that China's, China's foreign policy is not to bend her knee to Israel. Why else would China have a naval base? in the south of Sri Lanka. <laughs> a Chinese naval base on the south of Sri Lanka. After the conquest of Constantinople, there is the Khuruj of Dajjal. And then Damascus comes to center stage, which is why they're doing everything they can possibly do to get Zionists control of Damascus. They will even use Islamic Jihad that was born in Yankilan <laughs> to get Damascus for them. Hmm? With weapons from Saudi Arabia and weapons from Qatar and training in Turkey which is a member of NATO in order to get Damascus. Why? Because Akhir Zaman ends with the three most important people in the world all physically present in Damascus number one Dajjal is in Damascus number two Imam al-Mahdi is in Damascus number three Nabi Isa alayhi salam comes down in Damascus all three in the same place and so the, mat the battle for Damascus, which is now taking place, is not happening by chance. It is linked to the strategic reality of the world in Akhiru Zaman. The political reality of the world today is linked to the strategic reality. The Prophet said, alayhi salatu waslam, the people will flee from Dajjal. They will flee from Dajjal. This explains the Western world gaining the military power that they did to be able to conquer the whole non-European world. And when they had conquered, including this part of the world, Southeast Asia, the British were here, they then colonized and when they colonized, they transformed to make you a carbon copy of themselves. Are you putting the dots together now? So when they decolonized, what happened to your Khilafah? It's gone. <laughs> the Khilafah state is gone. No politician in the Muslim world dares to talk about Khilafah today. He'll be fired from his party. <laughs> yes. The Khilafah is not only gone, it's buried. And in its place has come something created by Dajjal. The modern state, the modern secular state, is Dajjal's creation to replace the Khilafah. And he gave to it something called state sovereignty that Allah is no longer Al-Malik. No! The state is now Al-Malik. State sovereignty, that's shirk. But that is only for a passing time, you know, like a cloud that passes by. And now Dajjal is ready to take back that state sovereignty. And so now we are learning the state is no longer sovereign. <laughs> 
No. The Security Council of the United Nations is sovereign. And we are moving in the direction of one world government. When you study Islamic eschatology and you realize that Dajjal is doing this in order that he might be able to establish his political rule over the whole world, then and only then would you be persuaded that a good Muslim, I'm not talking about part-time Muslims, huh? a good Muslim must ensure that he is not absorbed into that global society. He has to resist being absorbed into that global society. Because if you are part of that global society, you have said goodbye to the Khilafah. You can do nothing to bring back the Khilafah. But those of us who have resisted becoming a part of that global society and submitting to that world government, we are the ones who will be blessed to wage the struggle which will eventually culminate with the return or the restoration of the Khilafah state with Imam al-Mahli. And we will then, on that day, we will watch your secular state and all its nationalism and all its anthem and all its flags and all its constitutions, we'll watch it going down into the garbage bin on that day. Because that cannot replace the Khilafah. That's the political reality of the world today. There is the economic reality of the world today. The Dajjal uh, is uh, pursuing an economic agenda in Akhiru Zaman. And Nabi Muhammad Wasallam hinted about it. You remember when the angel came into the masjid and asked the five questions? The last question was, what are the alamat al-sa'a? What are the signs of the last day? And one of the two is visible there in KLCC. <laughs> Huh? He said, you will see the naked barefooted shepherds competing with each other in the construction of tall buildings. So that will be an age when progress will be measured. How high is the building? <laughs> progress is not measured by what is in the heart. No. Progress is not measured by my gosh, what a man he is. You can't buy him. Not with five ringgits. Not with 500,000 ringgits. Not even with five million ringgits. You can't buy this man. You can't intimidate him. He's made of iron and steel. He's priceless. What a man he is. Huh? You don't measure people anymore by these yardsticks. You now measure how tall is the building. That's the measure of progress in Akhir Zaman. But what was the second sign? He said that you'll find the, the, that the slave woman would give birth to her mistress. So it's only if she gives birth to a baby girl that the baby girl will rule over her. If she gives birth to a baby boy, the baby boy will not rule over her. Only if it's a baby girl, the baby girl will rule over her. So from this we know that there is slavery in our Khiru Zaman. There is slavery in Akhiru Zaman. There is slavery. Slavery. What is Bahasa for slavery? Oh, he doesn't know Bahasa. 
ha? hamba hamba you must learn bahasa <laughs> I need a good teacher to teach me bahasa so maybe two years from now I can come and lecture to you in bahasa inshallah come on say inshallah <laughs> so his strategy his economic strategy is to reduce mankind to slavery so they will be slaves and they'll be slave masters those who support him those who beat his drums like Singapore <laughs> they will be the slave masters and those who oppose him like Indonesia would be slaves how does he reduce you to slavery there are many ways but one of the most important of all and if we have any bankers here tonight I'm sure they'll confirm what I'm saying is the banking system is the banking system if you read John Perkins book confessions of an economic hitman John Perkins has simply put in writing what has been going on for centuries now the Rothschilds bank <laughs> has been doing it they lend you money not because they want to become rich through the interest payment they lend you money because they want to reduce you to slavery you cannot pay the interest they know it and as you cannot pay the interest you will be reduced to poverty and to destitution until eventually you are slaves so what they do is they lend the money to the king or to the Amir <laughs> or to the prince or in Egypt to the Khalif and he wants the money to enjoy an opulent lifestyle so he is borrowing the money from the European banks and from European governments but guess who has to pay back the money can you guess the people <laughs> he is borrowing the money they have to pay back because international law says the government represents the people so the people have to pay back the money and if you don't pay back the money then the banks will turn to the British government in the days when you didn't have aeroplanes huh? and the British government will send the British fleet and the British fleet will then start to bombard you and then the government will have to accept Britain will now take control of the finances of the country every Egyptian who is listening to these words will start to cry the tears will fall from the Egyptian eyes because he know what happened he knows what happened to Egypt how they establish an Anglo-French condominium over Egypt because the Khadiv borrowed money on interest and the poor Egyptian people had to pay pay back that money so now John Perkins now explains how it's done today and in this way a country is now enslaved that's the slavery of which the Prophet was speaking when money is lent on interest when money is lent on interest riba notice what happens Allah says in the Quran he has established certain laws of inheritance for example because he does not want wealth to circulate only amongst the wealthy he wants that wealth should circulate through the economy 
When wealth circulates through the economy, then one day for you, one day for me. So those who are poor today can be rich tomorrow. And those who are rich today can be poor tomorrow. That is a healthy economy. But when an economy is based on riba, on the banking system, wealth no longer circulates through the economy. So the poor are now imprisoned in permanent poverty. When they have you in that prison, then they have another strategy. This is not economic anymore, this is monetary. And there are very few who understand it as, but as good as Dr. Mahathir. And when I mention the name of Dr. Mahathir, I do it in a scholarly way. Because I am indebted to him. I am indebted to him. Only two leaders in the history of modern, of, of modern monetary affairs, only two leaders have ever challenged the monetary system as leaders. One was Charles de Gaulle. And because of Charles de Gaulle's attack on the monetary system, eventually the Bretton Woods IMF monetary system collapsed because France, even after Charles de Gaulle died, France kept on attacking them. Most French people don't even know that now. And so Charles de Gaulle's name, General Charles de Gaulle, should be written in gold. No alim, <laughs> no sheikh, no sad, no maulana, no mufti, none, 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 none. Ever analyze the international monetary system and declared it to be bogus and fraudulent and haram. None that I know of. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Tell me who he is. And show me what he's produced. And the second leader was Dr. Mahati, who with great eloquence denounced that monetary system as unjust. I wish we could have some more leaders like that in Malaysia tomorrow. This is not an interference in the politics of this country. I am not involved in that. This is a scholarly discussion. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam warned us. This is Akh Ilmu Akhiru Zaman explaining the monetary reality of the world today. He said that the river Euphrates will uncover a mountain of gold. You know the river Euphrates in Iraq? It will uncover a mountain of gold. Gold is a metal. Bahasa is mass. Mass, mass. Gold, mountain of gold. And people will fight over the gold and 99 out of every 100 would be killed, meaning not conventional warfare, nuclear warfare. And everyone would say, I am the one who will survive. But believers who were there at that time should not touch that gold. In Muakhir Zaman explains that that prophecy is today fulfilled. Yes, it was fulfilled when a, an ocean of oil underneath the Euphrates in that basin, when an ocean of oil began to function as a mountain of gold. After France demolished that monetary system, the US dollar had nothing on which it could stand. So the US dollar was in no man's land for two years, 1971 to 1973. And in 1973, thanks to a war which uh, the Zionists planned, both sides they were on, eh? both sides, the 1973 war, the Arab-Israeli war. The Zionists were on both sides. <laughs> uh, they were able to use that war to be able to convince Malik Faisal, rahimahullah. And Malik Faisal made the biggest mistake 
ever made by anyone in our monetary history <laughs> because he didn't have knowledge may Allah have mercy on his soul he was a good man Kissinger was able to convince him to sell oil for only US dollars that's haram that's haram uh, I am going to lecture on this subject inshallah on Saturday the 23rd of February at uh, uh, what's the name of that hospital Tropicana, Tropicana Medical Center in Kota Damansara and it's at 2 o'clock in the afternoon Islam and the International Monetary System hmm? at Tropicana Medical Center uh, on the Saturday the 23rd at 2 o'clock in the afternoon inshallah when Faisal agreed to that and got the other Arab oil producing states to agree then OPEC was born <laughs> and OPEC made it the rule and as a consequence of this law that you can only buy oil with US dollars the US dollar now kept on flying high and so it's no longer a Bretton Woods monetary system it is now a petrodollar monetary system and this is what the hadith was telling us Islamic eschatology could not have been established as a branch of knowledge a thousand years ago because a thousand years ago you could not understand this hadith <coughs> no <laughs> even to this day most Muslims do not understand this hadith this is the only time when you can now develop Islamic eschatology as a branch of knowledge in, in addition to this petrodollar monetary system where the US dollar now is free you just have to print it not the French franc not the British pound not the German mark not the ringgit only the US dollar there's no limit to the amount you can print no limit the sky is the limit <laughs> and now they don't even need to print it and I'm, I owe Dr. Mahathir this explanation he taught me, he explained to me he said they don't have to print it anymore <laughs> he says they just instruct the Federal Reserve Bank to write out a check so just a piece of paper one piece of paper for seven trillion dollars seven trillion dollars seven hundred thousand billion dollars and the Federal Reserve will send that to the banking system the key banks and it's still not money as yet when the federal when the banking system like the IMF when they lend the money to Mursi in Egypt Ikhwan al Muslimun who said the Islamic movement but they still want money from the IMF <laughs> and you sign the agreement to repay now it becomes money now it becomes money and so they can create as much money as they want as they want that's the genius of the job but there's something more I mean he, de he deserves a double PhD <laughs> it's not just that you create money out of thin air it's more than that when you say to the banking system I'm hereby giving you seven trillion eh, imaginary money the bank now has something called it's a funny name fractional reserve banking I don't know who coined that <coughs> malicious term what it means that if I have 10 ringgits in my pocket I can lend you a hundred huh? 
If I do that, they put me in jail. But the bank is doing that. By law, the bank is allowed. If you have ten ringgits, to lend a hundred. Hmm? If this is not bogus, if this is not fraudulent, if this is not haram, well, what is? This is the monetary reality. And this is not happening by accident. This is happening in order that they use this money to be able to so impoverish the people that they'll eventually end up with slavery. What should we do? Answer, get out of that monetary system and return to money which is in the Quran, money which is in the Sunnah, dinar and dirham. And I am making my own little effort, contribution. My contribution is, if you want to buy my books and my lectures, you can buy them in dirhams now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yes. At the back out there, we have someone from whom you can buy the dirhams, and then you can go and buy the books with the dirhams, inshallah. That will be a halal transaction. The rest, I don't know about it, but this will be a halal transaction. We have also the social and the religious reality of the world today. The social and religious reality of the world today is that all of mankind is being brought together to live one way of life. They dress the same way. They dress the same way. Same clothing, no matter where you go. A diplomat is always in a suit and a tie. Chinese? Yep. Russian? Yes. Congo in Africa? Yes. Jacket and tie. No matter where you go, they all dress the same way. The social reality is that men must take off their beards. <laughs> because this is not the age of beards. Hmm? The social reality is that women must take off the hijab. The social reality is that women must uncover as much as they can uncover. Hmm? Yeah, Nabi Muhammad told us about a time which will come when women will be dressed and yet naked. Imagine my happiness. I just attended a wedding reception. I won't tell you where. Don't ask me. Over 1,000 people present in this big hall. And I was so happy. There were only half naked women. None. Not even one. They're all Muslims. Only four, I think three or four women I saw without hijab. All the rest in hijab. All. All of them properly dressed. And even more remarkable than that, in 1,000 people, I did not see even one man dressed in European clothing. Not one. They were all dressed in their Malay clothing. All. And I looked in amazement. Where did these people come from? <laughs> and then when the meal was served, I said, oh my gosh, look at how simple the food is. Very simple food. And uh, the ceremony, of course, nikah had taken place before. The function was very short. The bride and bridegroom arrived, a dua, and we ate, and everybody gone. <laughs> Within half an hour, the whole hall empty. I noticed that when we entered, men entered one tra entrance, a woman entered a second, second, different entrance. One thing I didn't understand, however, the, the, bride, the bridegroom side gave me, all the guests got a little bag with a bottle of cooking oil, canola cooking oil. I didn't understand that. 
And then, from the bride's side, you got a dozen eggs. In the, you know, the packet in which eggs are sold? A big bag like this. So, I said, strange, I don't understand this part of it. <laughs> but that's not the world today. The social reality of the world today is that all of mankind are being brought into a melting pot in which now you adopt a universal vocabulary for example you no longer say assalamu alaikum alaikum salam now you greet each other with hi hi bye huh? this is the greeting and if you dare to use a salam wa alaikum, it's backward, eh? And not of the progressive society. The social reality is that certain vocabula vocabulary is being discarded. No longer from the lips do you hear subhanallah. You no longer hear alhamdulillah. You no longer hear astaghfirullah. You no longer hear inshaAllah. The sacred vocabulary is being banished in a new godless world is coming into being. This, uh, oh, you don't refer to children as children anymore. How many kids do you have? So I say to them, only Americans and goats have kids. The rest of us have children. Yeah? And then the uh, grandson will refer to his grandfather and grandmother. Where are you guys going? Huh? Grandson is speaking to grandpa and grandma. Where are you guys going? Open your eyes. The blue jeans Jamaat is not coming into being by accident. No. Even the priest in blue jeans. Even the pundit in blue jeans. And sometimes you see the Imam on the member, he has on the long gown, but underneath the blue jeans. <laughs> And now men in blue jeans, women also in blue jeans. Hijab on top, blue jeans below. And the blue jeans are becoming tighter and tighter. So she is dressed and yet naked. This is the social reality of the world today. It's part of the feminist revolution. And the feminist revolution is not a progressive step. No. Yes, I understand that there are many grievances that women have. Number one, if you were a woman, you'd be very angry. They don't allow us in the masjid. No. They don't allow us in the masjid. But Nabi Muhammad wasalam, said, the best place for the men is the first row. And the most dangerous is the last. Hadith is in Sahih Muslim. And the best row for the woman is the last. He didn't say woman outside the masjid. He said the best row for the woman is the last. And the one with the greatest danger is the first. Meaning that as the men and the woman come closer to each other, the sparks will fly. Hmm? Why? Why does Allah put the woman at the back? and the men at the front. It's not because the women are inferior. It's because the women can still concentrate in their prayer if the men are at the front. But if we men at the back and the women at the front, <laughs> no man will be able to concentrate on his prayer. A very simple reason. It has nothing to do with superiority and inferiority. But we have, re, we have, re, we have re taken the woman out of the masjid. So if tomorrow 
they build their own masjid. Don't cry and don't come to me to complain. You are yourselves the one responsible. And when they build their own masjid, a woman is giving the khutbah. And a woman leads the salat. Don't cry and don't condemn because you are the ones to blame. Did he not say, is it not in Sahih Muslim? Did the religion of Islam not come from Allah and his messenger? Does anyone other than Allah and his messenger have the right to make a permanent change in the religion? A temporary change, yes, but not a permanent change. If there is insecurity, you can say to the women, stay at home. Of course, which is what Umar radiallahu ta'ala did. But you cannot prohibit them from coming to the masjid. Don't tell me we don't have space in the masjid if you have enough money to build the Twin Towers. Did he not say that when the women go down in sijda, they must stay in sijda longer than the men? Did he not say that? Yes. Why? He said maybe the men, some of the men may not have enough cloth to cover themselves. And if a woman were to raise her head to a sword, it might be an unwelcome sight. So when you go down in sijda, the woman must remain in sijda longer than the men. Is it because they didn't have cloth to put up a partition in Marina? They didn't have coconut branches or palm branches to put up a partition? He did not put up a partition. So I will not. If you want to, you will answer on judgment day. But in our Muslim village, the woman at the back, the men in the front, as it was in Marina. The feminist revolution has come from Dajjal. And tomorrow is going to create the mother of all difficulties for us. Because Islamic eschatology tells us that there's a tomorrow coming when there'll be a calamitous decline in the birth of baby boys. Baby boys. He said that one man will have to maintain 50 women. Why would one man have to maintain 50 women? Because there will be a calamitous decline in the birth of baby boys, only baby girls being born. Why? Anybody has a cell phone you could lend me? Why would only baby girls be born? Here is one of the reasons. The, the radiation from the cellular phones, the radiation from the wireless internet, that radiation damages sperm production, weakens the chromosomes in the sperm. And when the male chromosome is too weak to fertilize the egg, the default would be a baby girl. That has already started. I gave this lecture at Cellcom. And when I was finished with the lecture, one of the technicians in Cellcom got up and said, Sheikh, we got the evidence to prove. You're right. He said that our technicians at Cellcom, who put up the poles, have all reported that they don't have baby boys. We have the evidence right here in Malaysia that this is correct. So tomorrow when you have to look for a husband, <laughs> and you want a husband who can give you a baby boy. Don't bother to look in KL. <laughs> if you want to find a husband who can give you a baby boy, you're going to have to go back to Kampung. <laughs> you're going to have to go back to remote countryside where this harmful radiation is not present. Finally, let me end. <coughs> All that I've said so far culminates in this religious reality. 
that we're living in an age in which the world is being embraced by universal godlessness. Universal godlessness. And this is the implication of the hadith. He sees with the left eye, Yajal. He's blind in the right eye. It looks like a bulging grape. But your Lord is not one eye. Between his eyes on his forehead is written the word Kafir. Written the word Kafir. Kafara. And so the world is being embraced with a universal kufr. Political kufr. Economic kufr. Monetary kufr. Social kufr. And if we allow ourselves to be embraced by that global society, what is the price we will pay? Let me end with this hadith. That on Judgment Day, the hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. You can check it out four times in Sahih Bukhari. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will address Adam alayhi salam and say, Take out the people for Jahannam. And Adam alayhi salam would ask, How many are they, O Allah? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reply and say, Out of every 1,000, take 999 for Jahannam. The companions of the Prophet والسلام, were terrified and he smiled and said good news for you. The one for Jannah would be from you. But the 999 would all be the people of Gog and Magog. So you better read up on Gog and Magog. You better read up. I have a book on Gog and Magog outside. Unfortunately only in English at, time, at this time. And so if you become a part of the universal global society, you heading for the hellfire. That is the reality of the world today. Strategic, political, economic, monetary, social, religious. And it is Islamic eschatology, which is explaining it more accurately than anybody else in the world. And it is time for you, my students and others around the world to get up and take this message out to mankind. Wage is struggle for jahidhum bihi jihadan kabira. Wage a great, a mighty struggle with the Quran and with he who was sent to teach the Quran that the truth might reach mankind. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samir alim wa alayna ya mulana innaka anta tawab rahim wa rahmatika ya akhbar rahim Dulil <laughs> Oh